And so the fact that he was able to flip the Sejuani ult, he just barely is able to kill this Sejuani. And he, he for sure would have lost if he didn't make that play. Welcome back to another Albato video. Now in today's video, we're going to be watching a game played by the champion of the Defender Cup, Cottontail. Now I just got done watching the Defender Cup. I had TFT on my PC and I was watching Genesis on my phone. I had a fantastic Sunday night. And man, all I can say is this TFT game is kind of lit. I think the current meta is easily the best it's been all set. And I'm just really excited to share this game with you. Now, before I get into the game, there's two things I need to mention. The first thing is that this game isn't even a game that's played in the final lobby of the tournament. It wasn't even played in the final day of the tournament, actually. Before you click out of the video, I want you to know that the decision to watch this game in specific was a very deliberate one, and you will not be disappointed if you stick around. Now, the second thing that I need to tell you is that I am trying to grow my channel, and I need you to subscribe before I can start talking about this game. Like, like right now. Okay, you did it? Okay, cool. Okay, then now that we have all that out of the way, let's get into the game. So he went for Glove Start. Not the most popular item start, but a lot of the item starts are, you know, extremely balanced. So it almost doesn't really matter what you go. And we can see that the first augment of the game is actually a hero augment. And before he ended up choosing this vein augment, he scouted the lobby and he saw that two other players in the lobby went spirit of the exile and he was seen he was he was given spirit of the exile as well but he opted to not go for it because he didn't want to contest when you take spirit of the exile you know you can still play a variety of comps but he didn't want to be pigeonholed in like the same uh like the same comp tree as you know some of the other players in this lobby so he went ahead and took spread shot. He slammed TG on his vein and he ended up losing his first two rounds. So he got dropped Ezreal and Vi out of an orb on one of the uh, minion rounds and he held on to both of them and it's for this exact reason. So he was extremely weak. He had a, like a weak board and in these lobbies where the first augment is hero, especially when one of them is a three cost, you can, you can expect it to be extremely difficult to get like a five streak in a lobby like this. You can see the person that's streaking right now, or the person that's 100 HP, they ended up getting the Zoe carry augment while having a blue buff. So uh, trying to beat a double bubble Zoe this early on is just something that you essentially like cannot do. I think it was a good decision to try and lose streak here. And then now that he, he's able to get underground in, he can start trying to stack up the underground uh, vaults. Now he just checked the admin there and I know it went by really quickly. It's actually very important for uh, later on in this game. And the admin was every five seconds, your team gains 12% attack speed. Some random admin that was not choosable and then every five seconds, your team gains 12 AP. And I think most people would just default to choosing every five seconds, your team gains 12 AP, because if you are playing admin on your board, there's a good chance that you like are probably playing around Soraka or LeBlanc, and those, the AP ones are better for, for them. But the thing is, is that you have to like understand that he has the vein carry hero augment. So he's not going to be like he's probably going to want this vein on his board for the entire game and vein scales a lot better with attack speed than ap so he went ahead and chose the uh, the admin that was every five seconds your team gains 12 percent attack speed and of course he took the admin out immediately so that he could make econ and so that he could keep underground in but like i said it's going to going to matter later on in the game so he was able to get a five loss that's extremely good he's 72 hp that's not too low 
anything below 70 is like pretty low so the fact that he was able to five loss with underground in means that you know he's not in the worst spot especially since he has you know, like i said he has underground he gets dropped bow rod tier and he ends up making shiv and the first thing that he's considering is to try and play a laser core mid game he said to himself man these items are like so bad i don't really know what to make and then he uh he was thinking about what he wanted and then or he's thinking about what he could make and what he could play and he he realized that like one of the only things that he probably could play alongside the vein carry hero augment was probably laser core so he went ahead and made the decision to make this shiv okay so a lot of things just happened there second augment of the game he snap clicked sunfire board he doesn't have anti-heal and sunfire board is one of those augments where if you don't have any form of anti-heal or if you don't have like any components that could make an anti-heal item he does have half of morello but he doesn't really want to make morello and look at every single one of the units on his board he's not like you can't even put morello on anything so it's pretty good to just be able to click sunfire board and then you don't have to worry about making anti-heal for basically the rest of the game so he goes ahead and clicks that he was shown his second or his first heist cash out and it was sword and five gold and he didn't want it so he went ahead and continued the heist he was able to win two rounds there but his streak got abruptly cut off and he lost the round on three four he's still first pick on the carousel because of how low he went in stage two and he goes ahead and goes for a chain now, i think the reason behind this is not because he wants to slam lock it it's because he just needed he just he has a lot of backline items so he just wants some form of frontline items and since he wants to play a laser core mid game that's like what he was considering Bane is also half of Edge of Night, and that's exactly what you want on a unit like Zed. I also forgot to mention that he had Sona Pair, and he ended up selling Sona Pair for Kale because he knows that he's going to have Vayne on his board, and he wants the two Duelist. He thinks a Kale 1 is probably even better than a Sona 2 because he has a, you know, he has a essentially a two item Vayne with the carry hero augment because he has, you know, Thieves Gloves on it. I also want to mention that Vayne recently got a buff and even though Vayne is pretty underwhelming, she actually kind of can dish out some damage now, now that she got a slight buff and I think her carry hero augment also got buffed. So that might have played a role in why he ended up choosing to go for this Vayne augment. Okay, so he ends up cashing out. I think that was 30 gold. 20, 20 to 30 gold and a reforger and now we can see the game has begun he's rolling for laser core units he's rolling for zed he's rolling for four cost carries and he's just rolling for generally good frontline units you can see exactly how he's playing this he really doesn't know what he wants to go for he he reforged Rod because he doesn't have any use for Rod. And he's able to get Sword, Chain, Sword, Cloak. And since he wants to make Edge of Night, he's probably going to go ahead and make that. And then he's just going to slam BT because that's just the other component. Now, he gets really lucky by actually winning that round. Because he was pretty dizzy on 4-1 on trying to understand exactly what he wants his board to look like. And if he would have taken a bad loss there, which he very easily could have, you know, he would be, you know, 37 is not that high. Anything below that, you're like, you're in like some, some, some deep danger levels there. He's able to find the Zed along with it. He's able to find a Samira too. So his main plan was looking for Zed and he's able to fully itemize it. But then on his roll down, he finds a Samira too. And he was given Lucky Gloves as one of his augments. He already had a TG, and then the Lucky Gloves gives you two gloves. 
So he said, screw it. I'm just going to put these gloves on my Samira 2, and then that's going to help me get through the rest of stage 4. He ended up selling a Yasuo pair last turn to make Econ, even though he could play Yasuo instead of one of these Brawlers. And it would give him three laser core, four duelist, and it wouldn't he wouldn't lose out on the brawler value because he only has two brawlers in. But he went ahead and sold Yasuo even over this Blitzcrank. And this exact this is exactly what I was talking about based on um, him looking at the admin at the beginning of the game. And I think it's because a lot of high level players are starting to understand that the two admin buffs are often really powerful. Admin is a trait where it's it's kind of hard to fit into your board, especially with AD comp, because Raka is an AP champ, LeBlanc is an AP champ, and then Camille is like a champ that you essentially, like you're only going to be carrying, like playing Camille on a admin board where you want to like carry Camille or if you're going for like vertical admin. But if you want to splash in two admin, you know, it doesn't really make that much sense to have, have a Camille on your board. Camille is essentially like extremely, you know, it's like, it's not that good of a unit. You can see here, he finds a LeBlanc and he puts on his board. And now he, he's getting this two admin where he gets 12% attack speed every five seconds. And you know, with a unit like Zed, Samira, and Vayne, all of them have essentially three items. You know, that's like a, a crazy buff for his board. And you know, that that plays a role in exactly why he kept this this Blitzcrank over, over Yasuo. And it's also pretty crazy to see that at the end of his roll down on stage four, you know, his board had essentially, like, zero traits. He had, like, two Brawler and, like, two Duelist, and, like, that was it. But the thing is, is that when you get to, like, this point in time of the game, or when, when you get, when you're, when you, when you have such a deep understanding of the game, you know exactly what units are better than others, even including, like, their traits along with them. So all he all he did was do like a big roll down on level seven, and then he essentially just played his strongest board with the best units that he was given. Another uh, interesting decision here is that he's able to get this bramble, and instead of choosing to put it on a Zac two, he puts it on Cho'Gath two, and I think the decision behind that is because. He's eventually going to sell this Cho'Gath, and I think he didn't want his tank items on Zac for some reason. He wanted to save a, a tank item for something else. I don't, I don't know if that's like the exact reasoning behind it, but that's the only thing that I can think of because I don't know why you wouldn't put it on a Zac two. Maybe if it was like a Zac one, it would make more sense. But, but yeah, and we can see that he actually does take out the admin here, and that's because he he got a fiddlesticks. Even though the admin buff is extremely strong on his board, Fiddlesticks is also an extremely powerful unit. Also, I think another reason why he chose to put Fiddlesticks in over this, uh, this admin is because he scouted and saw that a lot of the fights that he was going to be playing were going to be happening in a very short period of time. So he wouldn't be able to make use of the like attack speed over time buff. You saw that the fight that he played against was Setsuko, and Setsuko was playing a vertical duelist board. And you know, those games end very quickly. So that might have played a role. He thought the Fiddlesticks was going to be more useful than the admin buff. And the funny thing is, is that on the next carousel, he actually gets a, a Fiddlesticks with an admin crest on it. So now he's able to play Fiddlesticks and get the admin buff at the same time. And this is exactly what I mean when I say this is probably one of the craziest games of the tournament. Because look at what stage it is and look at the HP of this lobby. Everyone is still alive and someone just hit a Sedgewani 3 with 3 HP. 
This player has like Vertical Renegade with two Renegade spats. There's a Sejuani 3 player. There's a Kai'Sa 3 player. There's Cotton Tail, the winner of the Defender Cup, showing how flexible he can be in the mid game. And even going into stage six, every single player is alive. Like that is almost unheard of. I, have, I don't even think I've been in a game where every single person is alive going into stage six. Most games end on like 6-3 or 6-2 or 6-5. But like to have every single player in the lobby still alive going into stage six is, is insane. He wants items for his fiddlesticks. So he goes ahead and makes Rabidons because fiddlesticks is an extremely strong unit. He ends up selling Cho'Gath for an Echo 2 when he finds Echo. He's considering playing this Janna because it's Windy Weather Janna. We all know how strong Windy Weather Janna is. And you can see, even with Windy Weather Janna and him clumping most of his team, he had LeBlanc one hex to the left. <laughs> of this windy weather and he refuses to put it in the the weather because he knows how bad it is to clump your units i also want to make note that this cambuli guy that he just fought against was level 10 and cambuli was actually 100 hp going into stage 4 and is now 10 hp and has a chance of bot form now he really thought he was going to lose this round here I know you can't see his player cam, but he was like pretty, uh, you know what? I'll just go back because you can see that there's people that died there, right? But we don't really need to see the HP of the lobby, but you can see he's like pretty, uh, emphatic with his reaction. He really thought he was going to lose that round, die, and then end up getting a sixth place. Now that we are also in a top four situation, I'm going to go ahead and slow down the video so that we can watch the entire fight and see exactly the decisions that he makes. So he's able to get a Fiddlesticks 2 here, and he's just really praying that he does not fight the Sejuani 3. But the thing is, look at where his uh, his frontline is positioned right now. Even if he does fight the Sejuani 3, he's going to try and position for it the best that he can. And so he puts the Echo in the middle. And if you do not know, a lot of people might have seen like this interaction. But Echo ends up rolling through Sejuani, taunts it, and then look at the cast. The cast ends up going on the exact other side of the board and it like misses like most of his team. And the reason why Sejuani 3 is so strong is because Sejuani 3 stuns your board for 8 seconds. And so the fact that he was able to flip the Sejuani ult, he just barely is able to kill this Sejuani. And he, he for sure would have lost if he didn't make that play. So now we're in a top two situation and he's level nine this guy's level eight and he's on a win streak now there is an interaction that you might not know about with admin that is extremely powerful and you might <laughs> you can take a look at the other guy's board and it doesn't look like it's stronger than a board that has a Sedge 23 on it, right? But the thing is, is that his admin is whenever an ally dies, your admins gain 40 mana. And he's playing a mech frontline. So essentially what happens is two units die, and then every single admin on his board instantly gains 40 mana. Look at the MF. He has an admin spat on this MF, and this MF alts almost immediately because it just gains a bunch of mana from this admin. And then Soraka has this weird interaction where when she gains like a bunch of mana, she almost has like no downtime before all of her casts. So she just casts like a bunch of times at once. And even though he's able to beat a board with a Sejuani 3 on it, he's not able to beat a level 8 board with just 2 star 4 costs and a Fiddlesticks 1. But... Nonetheless, his plays were still strong enough where he easily could have gotten 6th here, he easily could have gotten 4th here, but he ends up getting a 2nd place. 
And plays like this is exactly what set him apart from the rest of the people in the competition and is exactly why he ended up winning the Defender Cup. Even though this was on day three, every point matters and essentially transfers over later on in the tournament through bonus points. So if we look at the scores from the event, if we go to day three, we can see that Cottontail ended up in seventh place. And the thing is, is that if he would have gotten a sixth or a fourth in that game, he would have had either two or four less points. Now, two or four less points would put him at 12th. And him being at 12th means he wouldn't get the two bonus points for the following day. And the thing is, is that he ends up getting two bonus points on the second to last lobby and two bonus points in the very final day of the or in the very final lobby of the tournament and look at how many points separates him and the number two spot dish soap he has 44 dish soap has 42 if he doesn't get these two extra bonus points then that means he's tied with dish soap and he actually ends up losing to dish soap because dish soap has one two three firsts on the final day and Cottontail only has one. And look at what the very first thing is that determines tiebreakers. Number of first placed. Number of first places. Crazy event. Crazy games. I'm really hyped for the future of TFT. And I just I hope you learned something in this video. That's all I can hope for. If you like the video, like it. And I'll see you in the next one.